basically this event is about um, remittances, you know, deconstructing the remittances debate, update and progress. Um, um, Organised by um, SOAS Pan African Society. Um, basically, as you know, um, um, as you know, the um, um, so and so as Pan African Society is pleased to invite you to deconstruct in the remittances debate, update and progress. Um, I'm just going to give you some background about this um, um, about this real issue we are having here um, this evening. In September 2013, Barclays Bank closed 250 bank accounts of community-based money transfer organisations. Um, basically what's known as MTOs, which many migrants used to send money back home to their families and loved ones. These included accounts of various communities, including the Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Somali, Ugandani, um, Ugandan and Zimbabwean and ETC. Only one large MTO survived after challenging Barclays on competition grounds However, that organization also lost their account last month. The effect, is, the effect is could be catastrophic for many communities as funds might be delayed or not reach intended recipients in the above mentioned countries of origin. It's said that MTOs do not meet the necessary international financial regulations and compliance procedures necessary to transfer money to the so-called last mile or the receiving end in the, country, in the country of origin. The Somali community is particularly hardly hit because of the problem is back home and alleged lack of functioning official banking institutions and regulatory framework. Again, it's this background, this event focuses on the efforts and initiatives that have been put in place to address this critical challenge. Therefore, the aim is, is to engage with the following question is, what engagements or efforts have been made to address the matter through the Safier Corridor pilot for remittances? Second, what role, if any, has sending community played to raise awareness about the matter? Third, how have the remittances industry and an intended community or recipient being affected by this. Fourth, what solution is, if any, have so far been have so far been proposed to deal with the critical regulations and compliance procedures and move forward? Um, speakers are include Marina Ali, the chairman of SOMSA, Saeed Hussein uh, from Telesome, Fiad Abdi. MF Global Solutions and Julia uh, from the University of Oxford. Um, I would like to you to basically welcome again for the, to this event. Thank you very much for listening. Um, first of all, let me let me um, sorry. Secondly, let me um, welcome Mr. Mirin Ali to speak here about this issue. السلام عليكم مقاعي قوحة اللي لهذا معين علي وحانا هي جيرمانكا وركا سوتاقا حوالا لها الصوماليات وبيسكو دي هي يوكي لندن I'm not aware if I had to do in English or Somali, but I will go in English to be on the safe side. To be on the safe side. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me start again. Uh, my name is Main Ali. I'm the chairman of SOMSA, uh, Somali uh, Remittance Association, uh, based in United Kingdom. And I. I'm taking part today this uh, um, small gathering or conference and talking about deconstructing the remittance debate, updates and progress. And I'll just give you a little bit of background of SOMSA, who we are, what we do, our activities, members, 
and uh, you know where we stand at the moment. Uh, this is the presentation outline. Uh, who is SOMSA and how do we form it, uh, the formation, the activities that we do. And Save a Corridor is an initiative that UK government is doing. It's a pilot project uh, linked to the banking issues. Achievements that what we, what we have achieved so far, our members, and the last one, next steps. What's going to happen in the future, which I have no idea. And who are we? And SOMSA stands for Somali Money Service Association. And it's a professional trade association representing a Somali MSPs serving communities and corporate clients throughout the UK and the world. And SOMSA is being formed uh, beginning of last year, and, and beginning of last year, April 2013, uh, by 17 members, 17 remittance companies, 17 Somali origin companies. And the name, we have named the association SOMSA, as I said, it stands for Somali. Uh, Money Service Association, and since that time, we have elected a uh, committee of uh, seven members who actually formed the association, which I was uh, proud to be a member of that committee, uh, who actually formed, and, and finally uh, was elected as a chair. And on, the, on that committee, and, and the main cause of this did not come from the uh, situation from the banking issue that started uh, May last year. As you can see, uh, we had a meeting and in Vienna, Austria, with the help of UNODC, uh, United, uh, United Nations, and, uh, and that is where it was formed. Uh, SOMSA, and, and after that, the banking issues and the trouble that followed started in this part of the world. And what is our main objectives, main pillars of SOMSA? Uh, our main pillars are in these four main pillars, which is a enhancing compliance addressing the banking issue, improving the industry reputation, and lobbying with policymakers. And that is the four main pillars that SOMSA stands. What is our activity? What do we do? How do we address? Uh, so we are uh, we actually focal point of the main point of, uh, of the industry, uh, liaising the regulators, banks, and other associations, such as IMTAN, UKMTA, and, and other international ones. We promote the highest level of compliance, ethical, and legal standard to ensure financial inclusion. We also sponsor uh, outreach education program to ensure that the Somali SSP, uh, MSP sectors are understood by uh, external stakeholders, and now uh, we also do uh, agent training, SOMSA wide. Uh, we also uh, do some rec uh, recognition to our members, our standing community, and the outreach uh, work that they do. Save a corridor and a banking issue. And Save a corridor, it's a, a UK uh, pilot project, and which is, I think, the only project that about five or six, uh, five or six different government departments 
are actually conjoined together as a, and this project, it actually combines um, five main uh, government pro and departments, such as HM Treasury, uh, DVIT, FCO, and Home Office, and the other parts of the government. And last year, one HSBC bank pulled out of the market, and the Parkless has actually closed over 250 MSP accounts, and the problem actually starts, and all our members have lost their accounts since then. And SOMSA are currently working on, uh, with a, a safety corridor. Uh, we are in the advisory board. We engage uh, directly with uh, with the uh, policy makers, uh, such as the uh, no, FCA, HMRC, and an NCA, who is actually uh, looking on the risk side of this project. Uh, BBA, British Banking Association, they are part of the advisory group uh, that we meet. Uh, it's supposed to be every two weeks, but now I think of <laughs> it becomes every other month. And, uh, and the project is still actually continuous. And it did not, uh, we still haven't got a clear, clear picture that what is going to happen, uh, what will actually uh, take place, who's going to run, and, and who's going to run the uh, project. What they're talking about, a couple of things, and which they're saying that, um, you know, the there will be a something called TTP or trusted third part will actually uh, and do something and to do with the compliance in in in, in the either second leg or third leg uh, third mile sorry of the uh, and of the corridor and uh, and it's still ongoing process and. Achievements. SOMSA um, have achieved a, uh, some remarkable uh, achievements. Uh, we are proud of uh, you know, the doing coordination by the uh, SOMSA members since there was no uh, direct uh, contact between the members before and then since we have formed, now we are uh, very close uh, contact and a one unit as a, as, a, as a group. We have developed a code of conduct to uh, members and increased mutual understanding and the communication between the law enforcement agencies and the soft, some, some members. And we have done some outreach, uh, outreach um, and general public and in, uh, in, in the UK, as well as the other, uh, you know, the and, um, stakeholders. We have taken part of a, this other project which goes on in the uh, third mile in Somalia, and, and we have been uh, to, these conferences in Garoe, uh, one in Djibouti, and another one in Hargeisa, all led by um, World Bank, UNODC, uh, and the regional uh, authorities in those areas of Somalia. And, and since uh, the other achievements that we have introduced a zero threshold and zero threshold uh, for IDs as part of enhancing compliance. What would happen before under uh, uh, the law in, in the United Kingdom allows only 
up to a certain level of threshold when you reach a certain level of threshold that is when you have to actually introduce uh, or, or actually uh, copy it uh, of your ID but to be uh, whiter than white and more compliant uh, we have actually introduced a zero threshold an ID system uh, we have also stopped accepting um, US dollars. Um, anyone who used the service will know that you know, the, before last year, um, people will actually bring a US dollar as a note, and they used to come to the remittance company and say, I'm sending this $100 to my mother in uh, Somalia, and this is the, uh, you know, the commission. And they have it either together or separate. And due to uh, and, uh, uh, working with the members and the uh, and government departments, such as the NCA, National Crime Agents, we have introduced uh, and stopped the, that using of the uh, U.S. currency and in the United Kingdom, uh, and, 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 and on the other side, you know, the, the money that uh, payment that we receive in UK, uh, we also stop that and paying out in US dollars. And, uh, and there was a branch of SOMSA has been actually uh, made in Dubai, uh, 5th of December, 2013, and that is another achievement that we went uh, our way to see the uh, world headquarters uh, and make them some understanding between the uh, members. Uh, this is the uh, current members of SOMSA and in a logo uh, or, or image way, and that's how they actually known to everyone, not as a name, but they know as a, 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 their logos and, and, and their names combined. And this is the message that we preach everywhere we go, that together we are stronger, and and we can actually chase any uh, an obstacle. And, and a final thing before I actually conclude, and um, I just wanna um, um, update some questions that has been highlighted, uh, I highlighted here uh, tonight, which I didn't have time to actually input uh, in my presentation. Um, which talking about the uh, engagement and effort that um, about the server corridor uh, pilot project for remittance, the role, if any, ascending community played to raise awareness about the matter. Uh, number three, how the remittance industry, uh, an intended community recipient, have been affected by this. And that is which I will actually go uh, and answer. And the solution, number four. And number three, how have we been affected by these changes? And honestly, uh, I cannot put uh, into uh, a words how have been the industry been affected the community uh, and, 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 and the entire, uh, entire service. And in this day and age, even if you have a, if you're running a small shop that, uh, and you're buying and selling uh, things, you must have a bank account, let alone when you're working in money. When you're working with money, uh, it is, 
you know, they, I cannot imagine the effect that it will have. We cannot even pay our staff their wages. We have to give them by cash. We are not allowed to have a even normal business bank account. Not about, forget about the remittance. A normal business bank account. As long as you are a, the nature of business is remittance and you deal with money, you cannot have a bank account. SOMSA, when we have actually uh, and put together everything, we try to open a bank account for SOMSA. And it says, as you can see, Somali Money Service Association. We couldn't open a bank account for SOMSA. They don't deal with money. It is just association. Uh, members' fee will go there, and we could actually use, um, uh, you know, to pay fees, accountant, uh, other things. And if we actually make uh, some invitation to somewhere, we cannot have a bank account. That is the effect it does have. Since we could not have a bank account, how do we, uh, we're dealing with money, how do we operate? How do we collect? How do we get money from A to B? It is a challenging for you know, the security, logistically, uh, and, and uh, I will say it is a really, really uh, problematic. And that have actually caused, uh, you know, the uh, lot of problems to the industry. Uh, we know the community. We could not, as an association, sit down and say, this is what we're having. Let's raise the fees that we charge because there is other overheads that we're facing at the moment. We know the situation because uh, the community have been with us last 25 years. The service has been standard as it was last 25 years because we have a few months, I will say almost now two years, a hiccup. Uh, we could not actually face the community who is actually uh, the backbone of the nation, uh, the backbone of the economy uh, of Somalia. And, and say we are raising our fees. Uh, so what we have actually done is we reduce our uh, overheads, we close some of the branches, we've reduced, uh, we lay off some of our staff and just to stay afloat. And that is every member of SOMSA. And uh, the solutions. How are we going to get over it? When would we have a bank account? And how are we going to actually uh, move forward? And it's not an easy answer, but uh, we are working closely with a, a UK government is, who actually taken uh, a action uh, and addressed the issue and unlike uh, other countries, I'm referring in the United States and uh, what is happening in Australia now, uh, 30th of October, three days ago, and was the last account that were, you know, the, in Australia remittance uh, and, and companies. And it's coming to other parts of Europe it is a, uh, I would say, a, it's reaching a epidemic level, and, and it is uh, really uh, difficult. I have been in the, with the industry last 10 years. All I have known was a risk management, risk uh, reduction, and risk prevention, um, something like that. What I've seen last year is risk elimination, in, which is uh, completely uh, a difficult environment to work. You cannot eliminate a risk. Risk is everywhere. 
and, and, and when it comes to a uh, uh, money service industry, it will always have risk, whether it's bank, whether it's remittance, and whether it's a insurance, uh, there's always a risk, but it is a, uh, a backbone to, uh, to uh, I will say, a large part of the community and is their lifeline. And, and, and the conclusion is we still haven't got a solution. There is a uh, project actually going on at the moment and we hope that uh, we could actually get um, something out of that. And I was addressing uh, and answering those two questions about the uh, meeting. And let's see, any question about SOMSA? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm kind of maybe selling a product. <laughs> The thing is, uh, there should be an answer for every question, and uh, there I am going to talk about a product that, and a service that we have done and in Somaliland for the last five years, uh, which can be, maybe can be an answer to one of the uh, difficult questions uh, uh, that's facing the remittance which is the, uh, the receiver's end, whether uh, we can identify him, we can, according to the uh, regulatory issues. So these are, uh, I'm just gonna uh, talk about this in, in, uh, in a, just a quick way. Uh, uh, my name is Said Gulet, and uh, sometimes I'm a, a chief of, of of a subclass sometimes, <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, it's like that. So I've been a technical guy for a long time in, the, in Telus Home. For the last 15 years, I've been working in the, in the uh, telecommunication, particularly in the IT department. And uh, uh, these are my contacts, so that's who I am. Mm. I like reading, I like the computers. I don't like war. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, uh, just to make you laugh a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm not offending anyone, I think so. Yeah, but particularly if, if some of us are in the God business, <laughs> which is being banned in the UK at the moment, yeah. Uh, let me talk about Telesom in a, in, a, in a brief way. Telesom is a 15 years old company at the moment. Uh, over 1,500 shareholders and over 1,600 employees in all parts of Somaliland. We provide services uh, mainly the mobile and then mobile broadband, which is uh, internet access from mobile. Then we provide fixed lines, internet, and then we come up with a Z, which is a mobile money or mobile financial service or whatever you call it. We have many other value added services in, in, in our company. A research done by Daris, which is a research institute in Somaliland, we are almost 80%. We are, we, we, we have the, the, the market, 80% of the market. Um, it's not, Somaliland is not that big, so basically you can see the, 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 the number of mobile subscription is one uh, million. Uh, 300,000, they are not all active, so that, that's the registered number, but they may, the active uh, subscription might be slower than that. This is where we work, 
Uh, we do not operate in Somalia, the rest of Somalia. So our prospectus is just Somaliland. We look at Somaliland, how is the GDB, how is, what is the, uh, all factories. We, we, we are only concentrated in Somaliland, so that's what, uh, where we work. And, and these are just uh, uh, overview of Somaliland, if some of you might not know. The income per capita is so low, and as you can see over there, we have Somaliland shillings uh, with these denominations. And uh, we always rely on maybe uh, World Bank and other uh, big institutions to do some research and say, your empl employment rate is like this and that. What is that? That is mobile money transfer service. So we share the common name of transfer with the remittance. We transfer money. Uh, it's free. That service is free. So people send money to one another without any charge at all. That's a big difference between us and other mobile money companies around the world. That is mobile, uh, it's a financial service, it's just it's mobile. And it's registered with Somaliland uh, Central Bank. These are, uh, this is the uh, portfolio of the Z. People bring cash, that is cash in, and they collect the cash out whenever they want, to, wherever they want. They can send to one another without uh, putting cash in and out, they can send electronic cash, and they can send uh, to the other regions of Somalia, like Puntland and, 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 and Somalia, Mogadishu. We have uh, other portfolio, which is uh, another uh, service, which is the Z Salam Bank, which is connected to that, so you can save money from your electronic uh, device, like mobile, to the bank. If you have uh, electronic money, you can put in the bank and you can withdraw some of, of your money from the bank account. So these are the, uh, the portfolio of Z. Uh, the way we deal with it, uh, because actually there is a physical money always as, like the remittance as well. So the way we deal is our customers, they register with us and they come to agencies and then there are dealers which are our branch offices around the country and then they all connect to the, to the main ZAT service pro, uh, 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 office. Uh, we have like 178 active agencies around the country what they do is they collect the physical cash from the customers, they give them electronically, they put this money at, at the deposit with Telesom so they will get uh, electronic cash as well, or they can collect the cash from there and just, just like that. Get electronic cash, give us uh, uh, the physical cash, or, or collect the physical cash and give us electronic cash. That uh, we started in early 2008. That's when uh, mobile money started in East Africa, like in Kenya and Uganda and likewise. We have built a system technically and then we have started to formulate the financial part of it because it is a very serious issue. It is very swift and quick money, quicker than the uh, mo uh, remittance as you can understand. So we have to have a very good chart of accounts. We have to have a control system. We have built all this in over one year. And then we have started to, 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 to start, uh, we have started the marketing and then sales and support and management and all this stuff. And then we have tested with our employees. In, in the company, we have got like over 600 employees, so we have registered them as a sad customers and we have given them the salary with that, and they have 
collected the money from the agencies owned by Z at that time because it wasn't in the, in the, in the market at all. And then we have sent some of the commercial guys to Uganda and Kenya and these areas to see how Mbesa and then MTN and Orange money is working. And then we launched. That was to register a mass of, of customers, which was not easy, which finally we found out that uh, we are not complying with you know, things you can understand. And then we start to extend the service and then to the rural areas. And, and then at this stage, we are reviewing everything from the registration prospectus and the compliance and this stuff to the technical and then the commercial and then marketing and everything. Uh, this is the evolution. And I think I have said it uh, in, in words, so you don't need to. Uh, is it just like that, so. So what is, how is that over there and how can the remittance companies get the potential and, and, and find out a way of, of, of that's why I, I have said before that I'm kind of selling a product. <laughs> so we have got half a million customer, 80% of them are male, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to find out why, because the literacy rate of, 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 of women is, is, is very higher than the, the, the illiteracy is very high in, in women. And so 80% of these half a million are, are male. 75 of them are active subscribers. That's 90 days when you look at 90 days, but if you go like 30 days or every month, it will be lower than that. And then we have 98% of our merchants active. And uh, the merchants are over 12,000. And 98 of them are, this is one of the uh, areas that Telesom and Zad has become well known uh, around the world. Because the number of active merchants show that there's an ecosystem and cash is going around. Because people will get to cash in anywhere and then to cash out anywhere they want. And then we have got like 178 active agencies. Some of them are in uh, informal, which means we, they, they are reputed customers and they have got a good business and then we have got some relationship and others are our own agents. Uh, for the last year, 70% of our airtime, the, the telephone, uh, calls was purchased by the customers using that service. So they didn't go to anywhere to have a scratch card or they didn't take any cash. And this is one of the advantages that very few has got in this well. In UK, if you are using a, a bay as you go and you run out of credit, you have to go out and travel. But over there, that all you have is all you need is to have a mobile money, or maybe your friend has got, and then you will have an airtime. Then you can continue calling. 55% uh, of the transactions in that are person to person. People sending money to each other. 20%, uh, 21% is an airtime, which is a product we sell. It's just our core business, the communication. And then 17% is person to business. You go to a supermarket or you go to a hotel or you go wherever, you go to a fuel station, that's the business. And then you send money to them. The remaining 7% is tra other transaction is like deposit and withdrawal and so on. The usage is very, very high. Imagine half a million customers are making 17 million transactions a month. Why? Because it's free. <laughs> it will not cost you to send the money from Tukarak, which is close to Garoe, all the way to, Luya, to Loyado. And maybe the, the remittance companies will say, you guys are killing us. Yeah, and, and in a way, it is.
We have to confess that. Uh, average transaction uh, per customer a month is, is like 50 transactions per customer. We have got like about 700 registered Z uh, uh, internal outlets in, in the country, over 12,000 of merchant accounts. There are many informal dealers who deal, mainly they are exchange, the guys who work on the money exchange. And it's 24-7 uh, free service. This is another thing I would like to share with you. It is said that uh, Somaliland population older than 15 years of age are estimated like 1.9 million out of 3.5. If these figures are 100% true, I don't know that. But we have got, if they are 1.9, then we have got like 56% of them. And then 42 of them are GSM users. And then, uh, I mean, 42% are Z subscribers, and 71% are active, always active. Okay. The Z spread is throughout uh, uh, the country, from all the way uh, from Outer Region all the way to Senag. And we have got uh, lots of, of big dealers, uh, agencies, merchants, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, literally more than maybe any remittance company in Somaliland. <laughs> I was in China in, in uh, 2008, and then I was asked, why do African men have a bigger pearly all the time? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was asked by a lady, and I said, quickly, we don't have banks. <laughs> <laughs> she was confused, yeah? <laughs> then she said, why? Uh, what, what's going on? And then I said, because that's the only place we save. <laughs> I was just joking, but in reality, we don't have banks in Africa. I mean. We have banks, but how many of us are banking? How many of, of us? I, I was just joking at that time, but to, truly speaking, in Africa, in the rural communities and in everywhere, they have no clue of what the bank is. They, had, they didn't have a bank account, and they didn't even think about it. Look at Russia. This is uh, uh, from the World, uh, uh, World Bank report. In every 100 uh, inhabit inhabitants in Russia, they have got 179 mobile users. That means is the, the, the ratio is like one to seven. It's, everybody has got more than one mobile. It's, it's, it's just like that. While we have got only seven. And then, look at this. How many of Russians use their mobile uh, to pay pill and something like that? It's almost none compared to us. And then, how many of, of, of us receive money or send money? It's just like that. So you can see we are fully utilizing the, the very few mobiles we have got. It's seven out of 100. Um, but we are using, we are utilizing heavily. Let me tell you this. <laughs> I would like the British government was over there, over here. This is my mom. Uh, I visited her a couple of uh, weeks before. She has no clue of what the banking system is. She has no ID card. She never traveled outside the country. She never had one. Me and my family, they, we always send money to her. And then the only thing that she has got is a mobile. If you can see, there is a, a white, something white over my friend's you know, head. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. That is a white paper with her mobile number is written. So she has got a small shop, 
So if anyone is coming to her or buying anything, yeah, he won't ask her the number, it just sends her. So that is how it is. But if I ask her, ma'am, do you want to have a bank account? She'll say, I'm not, I'm not a millionaire. I don't have money. That's how we perceive. There are millionaires in Somalia and in Africa who are like mom, to be honest with you. And they don't even know the compliance. They don't know what we are talking about. They don't understand. So she might be a victim of unseen man. <laughs> yeah, your son and your children will not be able to send you money because you are against this and that. No one knows you. <clears throat> we have very good relationship with the remittances. We are not uh, uh, competing with them, but maybe, as I have said before, they may think that we, have, we are killing their business in a way, but we are not actually killing it are helping them. So there are some remittance companies who has been connected to us for a very long time. The first one was Karan, which is now out of the market. Tawakal was connected to us for a long time. Tayo is there, uh, Fast Bay in UAE is like that. There is also uh, Well Remit, which is connected to our hub in, in Belgium with a company called HomeSend, which is connected to over uh, 27 uh, uh, other corridors uh, like um, MMTs and other companies. We do not charge extremely high to the mobile money transfer companies. Actually, we allow them to use maybe the services for free for quite some time. We welcome them, to be honest with you, and we pay their money out of uh, uh, question. We are connected to, to the bank, Salam Bank, which is just a, a, a daughter company of Telesom. And we allow people to send and receive uh, uh, money from their accounts. We have many partners from uh, government, uh, from uh, other businesses, from in NGOs and international and UN agencies. All of these, they receive money, they sell their products with that. Maybe SBI is one of the, you know, they sell the beverages like uh, Pepsi and this stuff, and they get all most of their uh, sales through that. And you can see the international NGOs like ILO uh, and others are connected to us. What do they do? They do cash disbursement, they, they uh, send money, uh, bulk payment to, to their beneficiaries wherever they are in Somaliland. Some of them, they pay pills and, and other utilities, and they pay salaries as well using that service. There is a web portal, they have got their spreadsheet and whatever they are using, and then they send to maybe 100 people same time. These are other companies and um, institutions who are connected to us. As you can see, the international NGOs are not uh, are among those who are uh, working with us. The people we are talking about are not uh, our real customers. Are not big people. Are not because basically the mobile money transfer or or mobile financial service. Is for unbanked people. Unbanked people are poor people. They don't have much money. And that is the people uh, doing their business with, uh, with that service. This small, you know, uh, you see they, they are selling milk or something like that. This is an exchange guy. He's exchanging between Somaliland shilling to to uh, electri electronic or maybe getting electronic cash and then paying the Somaliland. And then this guy, he's, he has got a charcoal, he brought it to the town, and then he will get his money with that on his mobile phone. Most of these, uh, those who sell the fruits, uh, vegetables and milk, um, bring it to the, uh, to the big cities and, and towns they don't come with their products. They just stay outside in the rural area, and by the time their products reach there, they get their money while they are there. 
The question is how do they get electricity and charge their mobiles? There are lots of ways they do, including the cars in the town will charge for them. <laughs> there are lots of ways uh, they do this. The people are very smart. You haven't seen, uh, I, I used to, when I was young, the torch, which has got three batteries. They use like 10 batteries on something, I don't know, but uh, they recharge their mobile phones. It's very interesting sometimes. Very smart people. The problem we have with the, uh, as well as you have guys, the Remington companies, <laughs> is who is your customer? It's a challenge. We have three types of people. Some of them are individuals in the urban areas. This is what we ask them. I think Julian has been there and she has to know this. <laughs> uh, we take their details, we take them uh, photos, we ask them IDs if they have got any, maybe passport, driving license, national ID, reputable employer ID. If he is from a reputable company, then we accept it. We ask them if there is someone who can be a guarantee or something like that. And then we ask them who is their next kin, maybe if he has if he diseases or whatever happens. Do we take the fingerprints and, and uh, other stuff, biometrics? No, at this stage. And why? That's, uh, uh, the answer is not easy. The business people, we ask them something extra. Do you have a, if you are registering as a merchant, you have to have a license. And that license should come from the government. So you have to come up with your uh, business license, and we have to see it and have got a copy of it. We have to ask them as well as a bank account. Because if you have got a business, you have to have a bank account, and then opening a bank account is not expensive as it was before, particularly when we have got like at least two big banks now in Somaliland, Dahbshil, and, and Salam. The problem is here, the unbanked people. <laughs> We take their details as well. Uh, we take them photos. We, we ask them if there is a aqil or chief of the tribe like that. <laughs> and then these questions are very important. The other stuff we do is like profiling and we have to know who is an ordinary customer and who is a business guy and who is not. And then there are thresholds they can send and receive a day uh, we make them monitoring. And um, now we are deploying a very sophisticated KYC, which will not be easy, to be honest with you, but we will try to do it. Which means we have to take their, we have to use a biometric system. We have uh, uh, hired some time before, like one year or two years before. Uh, uh, supervision, uh, some guys to check our compliance, if we are internationally compliant or not. They have given us lots of recommendations, we have worked with lots of them, and we are still doing to do uh, the rest. This is how we register. <laughs> you are going to, uh, to the uh, rural area, talking to a man with his uh, uh, maybe small farm or maybe his, uh, with his cattle and uh, his animals and maybe something like that. And then you tell him there is something called that. Can you use it? Do you have mobile phone? Yes, I have. Most of them will say yes. Or maybe my son has got one. Then we register them. But the problem is this. There's no formal identification system. So we have to uh, try our best to identify who is he. The majority of the people do not have an ID, any sort of ID. A literacy is like 37, so you can understand over close to 70% of the people do not read or write. It, they live in rural areas, so it's access is not easy. There is some socio-cultural issue. People are, they have got paranoia when sometimes you say, can you put your finger over here and say, why, why do you need my finger? 
So it's a challenge as well. Uh, and also, as I have said before, the women are the, the least uh, subscribers for us. And then they are the majority of the financial managers in, in the household. <laughs> they are managing the finances of the family. And they don't read and write. Then they are unlikely to have a mobile phone this is not specific to us around the world in, internationally, even for the developed countries. The rate of women and men compared to them, men and men are more uh, uh, has got more access to the uh, to the mobile systems in the world. So wherever you go, even the uh, developed countries is still there is a difference, but it's not like us. Eighty to twenty percent. That's absolutely. Big, big difference. To have a cash in, cash out in every remote area is not easy, as you can understand. And we, what we, our main objective is to, to have these people uh, be in the ecosystem, in that financial uh, uh, service that's going around. We are recognized internationally. Somaliland is not recognized. <laughs> Uh, lately, in this month, uh, in, in the last month, uh, Bill Gates has uh, uh, talked about that in Boston, and he was, uh, uh, that, that was not only his talk, but he has sent a delegate to Somaliland who came to our uh, company, and then they were very interested in, in the way we did the ZAD because they have read lots of reports about us, because there has been lots of uh, research and reports about that, comparing and benchmarking with the other uh, East African uh, countries and, and other uh, world players. Uh, we became, on, in 2012, we became the 14th in the list of, 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 of GSMA sprinters, what they call sprinters. And uh, we are still uh, leading uh, uh, in, in, in the mobile money in this world. We are leading. If we are at the top 20, we are leading <laughs> compared to where you are coming from and, you know, very small economy, unrecognized, uh, war torn society, you can understand. So we, we, are, we are there. <coughs> uh, even compared with Ambassador lately, the cash in, cash out. That was more higher than and, and, and than Kenya. The, the reason is obvious. The number is not the same. We are talking about half a million. They are talking about millions. And Bangladesh is about 13 million, and we are talking about half a million. We are still higher when it comes to cash in, cash out. Which means that number of cash ins and number of cash outs are very high compared to this other uh, providers. I would like to conclude with, uh, we have done a recognizable achievement, and we would like to be appreciated. <laughs> we want to improve our KYC, and I think one of the challenges with the remittance companies is now the sender can be regulated, simple as that, because where you are, where you are sending the money from, you can be regulated, but the problem should be the receiving part, uh, partner. Who is receiving this money? And then being a cash and this stuff is maybe that's the question. I'm not 100% sure, but this is something I really thought about. Uh, the world is moving to the digital. That's what Bill Gates was emphasizing. That's what everybody is saying. There are about 203 million mobile money users in the world now. That's a big number. Maybe in a couple of years it will be like <laughs> one billion, or maybe in a couple of years it will be, because this is very dynamic, it can be like two thirds of the world. It just depends on one of the biggest countries to deploy this, because India is, is considering now to do this. So maybe you, the sender, the remittance companies, should be handling with a digital 
mobile money, <laughs> not not the other stuff we are talking about now. Uh, so maybe we are the safe corridor. I'm not 100% sure, but <laughs> yeah, we can say we are the safe corridor because now if you send me money from UK and then I receive that money in my mobile, I'm well known. Uh, everybody knows me. This is my name. This is my mobile numbers. And someone argues that in not that far, not that far, people will be identified by their mobile numbers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Somalia and Somaliland has been a victim of a terror and some other stuff. Maybe the regulatory is going to victimize us as well. Uh, we would like to work with all the partners, the stakeholders, the interesting people in having uh, their, receiv their receivers, the, the receiving end, to be electronic and digital and to come to Z. Um, remittance companies, let me conclude with this. They can talk to Homsen, which is a, a hub which is based in Holland, in, in Belgium, and they can just send us the money without talking to us, like World Tremit has done. Or they can talk to us directly, and we can have a direct connection, and we can do the settlements and all this stuff. And uh, still, in, so in Somaliland, the, the regulation is, is, is coming up. We are pushing hard to have a better regulation because we don't need to be questioned for something we cannot you know, always answer. Yeah, because this is free service uh, for the uh, local people, and we have to have it done well. And, and because we, we are not just, there's nothing we are hiding in that, in that, in, in that, in that perspective. And thank you very, very much. Hi everyone, my name is Julia, um, and I work on a program that's called the Oxford Diaspora Program. Um, and I'm currently working on a project called, am I not? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm working on a project that's on diaspora engagement in post-conflict societies, and I've been working on the sort of Somali component of that research. Um, and, and this bit of the research looks at the, rem this, the remittance crisis. And it, I've been following the crisis since uh, May 2013, since Barclay's decision. And I've done some research both in the UK and in Somaliland, where I was, I was in Hargeisa in August, um, looking at kind of what's being done on the ground to tackle the issue there. Um, so this is... Um, this is a, because it's part of a diaspora program, my main focus has been on the role of the diaspora in addressing the issue. Um, and I've looked at the ways in which the diaspora has been engaged by various different agents. Um, but today, a, a sort of offshoot of, of the, the research has been um, looking at the, um, what's being done around the issue more broadly. And today I've been asked to talk about sort of the view from Somaliland. So, what is being done on the ground on Somali land um, uh, from the point of view of, of mostly the government, but um, also other agents involved in the issue. Just, to, just a few points. I'm, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm not an expert on finance, so I'm just going to raise a few questions. I'm going to be very brief, <laughs> um, and maybe we can come back to a few things in the discussion. And I guess my talk connects uh, more closely with Mi'in's um, discussion about the safer corridor. I'm going to talk about how what's going on in Somaliland kind of fits in relation to the safer corridor that's being done here. Um, also, just just to say, some, I've chosen Somaliland, uh, that, but I'm not trying to be representative of the entire region. I mean, this has just happened to be where I, where I managed to go over the summer, but of course I'm not speaking here about what the federal government's doing um, or sort of for, for, the, broader re for the broader region. Um, but I think some of the things I'll talk about raise issues, uh, raise, well, provides an insight into the sorts of issues that can be looked at in trying to solve this, this problem. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a a question I raised at an event that took place really recently. Some of you might have gone to the Somali Week Festival event 
a few weeks ago, and it was on the remittance issue again. Um, and there were representatives from DFID and um, Paul Han was there talking, and uh, representatives from uh, there was someone from Oxfam as well. And I asked a question around why um, the safer corridor had wasn't really um, spoken about much in Somaliland, right? Um, because one thing I noticed when I went back was that when I brought it up in conversations with government officials, uh, with um, the Bank of Somaliland and various other people, a lot of people dr brushed it to a side. Some people said they didn't really know much about it um, or just weren't really, didn't really get what it was and just, or, or, or just didn't want to talk about it. Um, and I asked the panel at Somali Week Festival why that was um, and both representatives from DFID and Oxfam said, well, that's really strange because we actually spoke to a lot of people in Somaliland, including ministers and the bank, the central bank, about the issue uh, before you went and after you went to Hargeisa. So it's very strange that they didn't talk about it. So perhaps there's an issue here with it wasn't so much that they didn't, people didn't know about the safer corridor. It was more that maybe they weren't quite trusting it or they didn't see it as a viable solution yet. Um, and, uh, and maybe they didn't see it as a process that was compatible with what was happening on the ground in Somaliland. So what I, just, what I want to talk about here briefly is what is happening in Somaliland um, and how that might fit in with the safer corridor. Because actually when, when you look at the sorts of things that are happening in Somaliland, the, the solution that's being proposed is very similar to what the safer corridor is doing. So, and, and, and that involves um, trying to restore trust in the money transfer sector by formalizing a flow of information and controlling and monitoring transactions. That's what the Safer Corridor is doing. That's very much what uh, the central banks is, is doing in Somaliland. And there's a sort of underlying hope here that by making the system more transparent, by formalizing this flow of information, banks will eventually take on the accounts of these remittance companies. Um, I won't quite go into whether that's the right approach here, but maybe we can talk about it later, whether this is the way that the issue should be solved or, it's, or, or not. But um, what's interesting to point out is that this isn't, the, the solution isn't challenging the geopolitical context, which has forced many of these banks to stop banking um, MTOs. So, so what's happening in, in Somaliland? Well, one of the main things that's going on is when I was there, there was the launching of the draft of the anti-money laundering uh, legislation, which was um, it was launched uh, at Mansour Hotel, unsurprisingly, on, and it was at a conference on remittance compliance and financial crime. Um, and this re regulation was very much pushed forward by the crisis. Um, and it was a, it was and the central bank, the Bank of Somaliland, has been leading on on this, but uh, at the conference there were sort of five ministers, the governor of the central bank was there, and it was uh, attended by the, by the money transfer sector as well, um, as well as the newly formed Somaliland Remittance Association, which includes uh, 15 uh, remittance companies and is working also closely with SAMHSA. Um, what's, what's interesting about this legislation is that um, the sector, the money transfer sector already has AML controls in place. So, and they've already developed a, an expertise in this area. So in a way, this, this legislation is adding another layer of supervision on top of what the sector is already doing. Um, and in fact, the sector have been fully cooperative in this. Um, and with that, we're engaging quite closely with the government there um, and the central bank. And, and this is quite similar to what the, the Safer Corridor is proposing. It's not proposing something new. It's proposing to sort of um, create another layer on top of what the sector is already doing. Right? Um, I think there was an issue, though, that was pointed out at the, at the conference as well in that um, often, uh, you, and, the, and I think this is quite common in Somaliland, that um, there's, a, there's an... Uh, uh, an issue of independence of the regulatory system. So often you get the private sector funding um, sort of capacity buildings or training for the public sector. And because the private sector is much more advanced than the public sector. So this was an issue with the AML legislation. The, uh, the private sector would be sort of telling what the, the central bank what to do with it. 
Um, and and this, this AML legislation has gone hand in hand with the development of the central bank in Somaliland, and it's very much in its infancy. Very, very, there's, very been, there's been very little uh, training on the issue, even though the World Bank has been trying to work quite closely with the Bank of Somaliland since 2007. Um, and interestingly, some of the directors of the central bank said at the conference that it was the first time that they, they met some people from the sector. So they really haven't been working closely. So this is quite a good step forward in that direction. And, and, the, and, and it signals a shift in the central bank from moving from acting as a treasury to sort of a regulatory and monitoring um, institution. The second big um, development that's been happening uh, in Somaliland is the introduction of the national ID systems. So over the next few months, the civil registration has, uh, which has already begun, will complete by, and will complete by December 2014. Um, it's current, so it's, it's currently underway and it's introducing a biometric smart card for Somalilanders under the age of 15. And the idea is that this will serve um, as um, that these, these ID cards will also be used by the money, uh, by MTOs when they are requ whenever they require ID from their customers, this will be a way of um, improving know your customer regulations. Um, and, but similarly to uh, what we were saying, what I was saying before is it adds another layer because a lot of the, se the sector already has its own KYC um, uh, policies in place as as, um, as we've seen for the case of ZAD, for example. So here we see again how the, the central bank is adding another layer of information, right? Um, and it's very similar to what the Safer Corridor um, proposes. Uh, so just, um, so then I just wanted to point to a few things where if, if the Safer Corridor and the processes that are going on on the ground are kind of doing the same thing, then why, um, how, why are they not quite working together and where are the points of contention? And when I spoke to some of the people, um, in the, some of the ministers and, and people in the central bank about the safer corridor, and sometimes I explained, I found myself explaining what it was about. Um, one thing that they pointed out was uh, the problem of how this trusted third party will fit in with what the central, central bank is doing already. So I think that's something that needs to be thought out. How, the, how, is the, how will this work? Because there was a concern in the central bank that the, the, um, the, third, the trusted third party would be challenging the sovereignty of the state. Um, so, so that's one, bit, one problem about, um, that needs to be thought out. Um, the second is about, is, um, how, is about how the national IDs will fit in with um, the electronic cards that are being proposed as part of the safer corridor. Um, so that, that's another thing. The safer corridor, sort of a, part of the suggestions are to introduce these electronic cards that MTOs will then use to register their customers and, um, and know their customers. So I guess that needs to be um, thought out about how it will fit with the, the civil registration process. Um, and then ultimately there's the problem of trust. So these, these solutions ultimately all, re all rely on the fact that banks will trust either the Bank of Somaliland or the trusted third party, and they will then start banking. They will trust that these, these, um, these bodies are sort of regulating and overseeing the transactions and will then eventually bank um, MTOs based on this trust. But perhaps... Um, these solutions might not be enough um, and maybe the whole issue isn't one of transparency um, and so we need to we need to also make sure that we are dealing with with, with the right issue right so I think I'm just going to stop there and leave space for discussion hi everyone um, my name is Fahad Abdi and I'm from a company called MF Global Solutions uh, before I begin, I just want to give an introduction of a bit of background about myself. Um, I actually went to Queen Mary University uh, about 10, 10 years ago, which is part of the University of London, SOAS. Uh, I majored in computer science. Um, I then went on to work. I was quite fortunate that when I graduated that IT, information technology, 
the market was kicking off in a major way. You know, th these, these, these are the times where companies like Google, Apple, Oracle were really peaking, and technology was key, and technology was hot. Um, so I was fortunate to be part of that era, um, where I worked for a, a quite a big company in, in the UK, an American company, where I was traveling around the world, doing specializing in various areas. Um, I then went on to work for the biggest database company in the world, Oracle. In fact, I am an Oracle consultant. I'm an Oracle certified professional. Um, I worked in Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco. I've worked in New York, Paris. Um, and really, I specialized in building solutions, technology. Um, I then worked for Dell in the UK, in Bracknell. And again, Dell was going through a major shift. They were, if you wanted to buy a PC, you would get it from Dell. Obviously, things have changed now. Um, you know, you just went online, and uh, we actually developed what we call a single instance for the whole of Europe, where if you went online, you know, there was, there was a single database that connected everyone across Europe. And at that time, it was the biggest database system in the world. And we launched that in South America and then in China. Um, I became independent, really. I'm an independent consultant. I'm a freelance contractor. So I know about building solutions. I know about looking at a problem and presenting a solution. So deconstructing the remittance debate is quite interesting to look at because it's a problem. And most IT solutions come from a problem. And from that problem, a business is built, and from there, money is made. Um, so it's quite fascinating to see from, from my background in terms of how this problem could be tackled in the same way that Dell had a problem, Oracle or whatever, all the different clients that I've been working with, where you have stakeholders and, 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 and you present a solution to them, maybe two or three different options, and then a solution is given. So based on my experience, based on my background, I, we believe in MF Global Solutions that actually mobile money is the solution um, for the remittance debate. And I think uh, Saeed touched upon the, the key elements that is required to resolve this issue. But looking at this problem in the context of the whole region, not just Somaliland, but we have obviously Puntland, we have South Central, and the remittance issue is, is, is the, covers the whole of Somalia. So we really, we're looking at a solution that, is, that can be reached to everyone within Somalia, not, not just Somaliland. So I've put a couple of slides together to touch over the introduction of mobile money, MMTs, and some of the things actually kind of overlaps with what Saeed has been talking about. So I wouldn't go into much details about those issues. Why mobile money transfer? Well, really simple. I think Saeed touched upon it. There are three billion people that have a cell phone but no bank account. We call these people the unbanked society. These are the people that banks don't want to do business with. Why? They don't have any savings. Banks are only interested in people that have savings. But they have cash. There is money. And most of their money is disposable cash, i.e. they get paid by their employer, and all they want to do is pay for goods. And they need a mechanism to pay for the goods. The rest of their money comes from international remittances. So if you combine the two together, you have what we call the full ecosystem, which Saeed kind of touched upon and talked about. Mobile money is the new frontier across the globe. In Africa, it's huge because it started off from a need. There was, it was a problem that started off from a need. It wasn't a problem where someone wanted to make money, you know, because if you want to make money, you work with banks and you start a business. You don't go and invest millions of pounds into technology that's going to be used with someone that doesn't have any savings. And we talked about other things. I talked about financial inclusion. This is a key critical word, really, because that is critical for social development. We know that mobile money is for sure better at reaching rural areas. That is a fact. Uh, and also, it is a service that is available 24 by 7. And that's key, um, having the ability to transfer money to, to anyone across the, across the globe 24 by 7 i.e. you're not dependent on an agent uh, where, 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 where you would do what's called an over-the-counter transactions, i.e. you're working within business hours. So those are some really high-level reasons as to 
why mobile money transfer is a solution that could definitely resolve the remittance issue. So what does it mean, mobile money? You know, so if, if one wanted to open a business or even to look at, at the entity of what makes a mobile money, there are three key things that one needs to understand. The first thing is technology. And this is the bit that a lot of people struggle with. What is mobile money? What technology does it sit on? In a nutshell, it's actually called an M wallet, a mobile wallet. We all have wallets in our pockets. And in that wallet, we've got different credit cards. You have a MasterCard, Visa card, some of us have cash, some of us have coins. Technology has changed now. There's no need for anyone to carry a, wallet, a, a physical wallet in your, in your pocket anymore. This is where the concept of M wallet comes in, mobile wallet. Traditionally now, in, in systems like M-Pesa, ZAD, the mobile wallet is actually stored in your SIM card. You know, we all have mobile phones, and in the mobile phones is a SIM card. That's where your wallet is stored. To me, that kind of presents a problem, because you're tied to the telco. That is a huge problem. Now, if we're looking at the remittance issue, the issue needs to be global, i.e., it needs to be independent of telecommunications. You, you know, we need, we need a solution that stores M wallet, but not tied into a cell phone, i.e., a mobile money operator. Because as we know, if we look at the complexity of Somalia, we have different mobile money operators across the three different regions. Right? So one of the things that I would recommend, or we would recommend, is to use the cloud. Cloud services. You know, nowadays you can store your wallet on the cloud. You know, it doesn't have to be tied in into, into your SIM. The second thing is regulations. Regulation is critical to the market that you're playing in. Um, and that presents significant challenges. Why? Because most of the regulations either come from banks or local governments. Neither of the two exist in Somalia. Um, so that presents significant challenges. Now to overcome those regulations, you need a partner. You need, you need a partner, a financial institute that would actually help you churn out those regulations. Uh, and I've actually worked and had conversations with other institutes that had these similar problems. And what they managed to do is actually, some of them were MNOs, some of them were uh, banks. They, they, the government wrote the book, the rules of the regulations for the business. And, and that could work, that, that it's possible. So these are the three key things. Technology is number one. Number two are regulations. That presents significant challenges. And number, number three is find yourself a partner, a good partner. That could be a local bank, that could be an, an, an MNO, someone who's done this before. So with those three things, there are three key elements that make up um, the operator to offer a mobile money service. I'm just gonna throw out some statistics here because it's important to understand um, the power of mobile and remittances. According to GSMA, the global remittance market could be worth $1 trillion within the next five years. Could be worth. And that's across 2 billion customers with the help of mobile money. It's, not, it's no way worth near that region at the moment. But G GSMA have actually recognized that the future for remittances is mobile. And if it went that way, within the next five years, it could be worth a $1 trillion. That is huge. That is a huge amount of money. And this can be achieved through two key ways. One is access, and the second one is cost. And I'll talk about those two bullet points in details in the next two slides. <laughs> access, I think we talked about, and bank society. It's quite a key word. Is, I think these statistics go back to 2006, but the numbers have gone slightly up. Again, according to GS GSMA, um, there is about 5 million bank branches across the world, 1.5 million ATMs. We have two now. We have one ATM in Somaliland. We have one ATM in South Central, I believe. But that's not a lot. That's not enough. But there are 6 billion mobile subscribers across the world, and that number is growing. So un unsurprisingly, as you can see, and I think Zaid talked about the bank account penetration compared to the mobile 
phone subscriptions, you could see where the trend is going. You know, there are more people using mobile phones and using their mobile phones as bank accounts than actually going to a bank and opening a bank account in developing countries, and even in far places like China. So to actually find a viable system that would actually, or an ecosystem that would cover all those elements end to end, it's quite a challenge. But there are ways to do it. And I'll talk about in details what that solution could look like. Cost is most important. So we talked about access. The other thing is costs. The average cost per transaction for remittances is about 15%. So it costs the business 15%. If the value is below the threshold, which is $100, then that increases to 25%. So that's a huge margin. That's, that's a lot of cost because of remittance companies. Now, with mobile technology, you can actually reduce this cost because the idea is if your overheads are low, then your margins are high. How does it do that? Well, with mobile money, you don't need actually agents. Traditionally, in, if you look at the majority of customers that send money, especially the Somalis, they tend to be older generation. So you may not get rid of agents, but you certainly don't need as many agents as you would because there are overheads for remittances in terms of collecting the cash. And I think Marin talked about that. Counting the cash, reconciling the cash, you know, um, connecting the transactions that has been taken throughout the day with, with your transactions in the bank account. So there's a lot of overhead. And all of that could really be um, not used and not utilized as much with mobile money. So the World Bank estimates, and again, you know, the World Bank also recognized that the mobile money is the way forward for remittances. So there's you know, G GSMA. Um, so the World Bank estimates that reducing remit that if you reduce the commission rate of the remittances, as it currently is about 5%. If you reduce that down anywhere between 2 to 5%, then you could actually increase the flow of remittances up to 50 to 75%. So if you reduce your overhead, reduce the cost per transaction, you increase the flow of remittances. So it's a perfect business model, really. So we keep talking about ecosystems, mobile ecosystems. What exactly is that? Um, this is really quite a complex diagram, but rather than reading the details, I think the key thing to understand is the key entities within the ecosystems. This is what makes up mobile money. This is what creates financial in inclusion. And one of the key things is what's missing at the moment is, yes, there are services in the UK where you're able to send money to one's phone, which do due diligence, which do AML, which do KYC, but it stops at there. What really is required is a complete ecosystem that has complete transparency. Now, what do I mean, what do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Today, if we, if we look at where we are, is we all have bank accounts, we all have credit cards, we all work, and all our money goes into our bank account. I can look at anyone's bank statements, and it'll tell me exactly how you spend your money, right? Because ev everything is there. The banks know who you are, the banks know how you spend your money. Shops know how you spend your money. So w what's missing here is that system. And that is crucial to running a financial institute or financial inclusion. So the flow of money, when we talk about the flow of money is money is sent cross-border, it gets into the receiving country, and it disappears. No one knows how that money is spent. It may go to third-party companies, and those companies will tell you, but the chain is not there. So where mobile remittance ecosystem could come in is to develop a, a system that records all of these things end to end. Obviously, it will be run and regulated by the local government. You know, it would not be run by individuals, but this will be run and regulated by the local government, the same way that things happen here in the UK. You know, MasterCard, Visa, the, the UK banks, there are regulations which they, which they adhere to. So if we look at this diagram quickly is we have the consumer and we have the distributor. So the distributors are typically the agents. We have lots of entities in the middle. So what makes up the mobile remittance ecosystem is, as I said, 
the wallet is key. Technology is needed to store that wallet, and it needs to be independent of t telcos. It needs to be independent of banks. It needs to be independent of, you know, it needs to be a global wallet that everyone can use across. You will need a mobile operator because, you know, we are dealing with mobile money. Um, we are dealing with communications and text messages, etc. And we will need a bank because banks are critical to financial services and they do enable remittances to settle cash, to reconcile their cash, to make sure that the cash is regulated and the majority of the regulations actually do come from the bank. And then there's a key entity that we are proposing called the RSP which is the remittance service provider. The remittance service provider Key, its key function is really to connect the services and to administrate the connectivity of the services. And finally, we have the distributions, which are the agents. This is even a, a really more complex diagram, but the key thing to look at is we talked about cash in and cash out. Yeah? So on the right-hand side, you've got someone doing a cash in transaction. This typically can be done at an ATM machine, or a point of sale in a shop, or an agent over the counter, like most of the remittance com companies do, or a branch. And then there's a lot of things happening in the middle, which you don't really, which which is, I would say, quite technical. But it's where the RSP would come in and handle the messaging of the data going through from the distributor, who is cashing in, from the sender, and to the receiver. And what's uh, and the set? I've, I've talked about the settlement process. The settlement process in any mobile money system is key, because that's where the cash goes in. And as we all know at the moment, there are banks in Somalia, but they're not recognised by the World Bank, so that poses a problem. Yeah. So I think we we talk about Salama Bank. We talk about all the other banks. So in order to bring full financial inclusion, one of the key things that is required is to actually have regulated banks, banks that are recognized by the World Bank, then any system can connect to those banks. Um, thank you so much for um, the discussion. Hopefully it was insightful as well to all you. Um, we're just going to drop it um, into question and answers now. So if you have a question, please put your hand up and then direct it to the person. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, mobile money wa yani solution or hawaarid wa istamal karayan. And Makal Akta Ladonio Duro, why you make a doom called them Hadalic Kimbinasha like West World Dream It, your Western Union, even a doom called them the online mobile or future Korea. Maka Anugu experience, but then I lay a high system Yasha Makala Sameo, Marahadai and his system when accent, La Sameo, mobile money was system car or Anuku. شعلنا هاي إن حوالي دو استعمالان هدا أركتنا actually ما أنت ما كوقف قدوني العقد ترى agent كم حوسي تلفون نمبر كيسة سمعها العقدنا ما كو ودن كلو ترى قف ك text message وهلا مركز system كوا اسمه mobile هدا يعني سدا هو أركتت إن كم بنكي وحو مرة يا ماشي وقف عنيد إن وحن لشقيني نا دولة إنجليز كا أو هذا وده إن مشروعا أما برنامج كان تجابة ده أول يراه ذو سيف كوريدور نوحة ونمرية استيج كي نحى ولي موسن قارين ماشي كما تبين تأهيد تاسو لو تلقى لي إن سيتويشن كا أما حالة ده هذا اللي وجره لو قبحه الله هلا بنجيو يو سي سيف إن العقد أقعده إن ده كي لودري إنت بق إن أنا قولي تا نوما مقاطع واحد عدينا ما هينه إن باركليس يو دولة الصومالية إن أي وضع هذا الأصعدان أو أرنتاس أي كدم بيسي إن وضع هذا الكاس أوجي إن لوحر بنجيدي واحد عدينا ما هينه إن واحد لمرية سنة كي سنة يبر سنة كي لواد بيكون وضع هاي هذا ولينا واحد عدينا أرنتا كوسا بسبب هينه واحد قباء إن أي تاي كتر كتن يو أرنتا متقناي وده حيسا الصومالية ده حدود ما سنة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله صلاة 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 أن عبد حافظه أن سلام خروش وقش يا جماعة شباب واحد شراء حوالي ذب بدن أنا وحدا وإما كمل عقنا صدرة أن هدي مركز للدون أيو إن 
أي مشكلة شرتل وجه حليو إن حديد لا لصم يو موبايل مونيس كود موبايل موني كم مونيس كودن كتره وحنا هاي كوجو ماركتي متشورسن وجو ماركتي إن وقت دار سلام ركانا ضدكو أي كلسوني يو ماركتي إن أي سين تراس فر بدن مركا وحنا وركانا معقول تهاي إنه شباب كنا غضم مشكلة شرت أنا و عندنا حرير ما نلصم يعني المركة أرنتي حاجة كي يكتب قال هندول ده إنجليزكا سووتها أرنتي حوالة ده هي آذو خصيصة أنا قلنا حوالة ده البابان أوفر رأي أي كسا قالان مارتي أدي جيج الزاتك مركة ويكرر جان كران حوالة ده هو شواب أدي جاسي إنه شغل الدنيا نقطة